in ag, in sustainability. We need to all be preaching the same message. We need to all be on the same team. With sustainability, my view is we're either all going to win or we're all going to lose, which means that there's a lot of opportunity to get everybody involved. Everyone's got to play a part. Um, we just hope to be a part of the conversation to help to lead the charge. That was Mitchell Hora, and this is the Farm Traveler Podcast. I'm your host, Trevor. Thanks so much for listening. Like I said, today our guest is Mitchell Hora of the podcast Fieldwork. So Mitchell, as well as his co-host, Zach Johnson, have the podcast, which is all about kind of what row crop farmers do and kind of the science behind it. So they interview other farmers, scientists, people in universities, as well as CEOs of varying companies to kind of talk about all there is to do with row crops like tillage, cover crops, what carbon credits are and how they work, as well as the overall theme of sustainable agriculture, which is really interesting and something that we are all about. So if you're a farmer and you want to learn what they are doing, be sure to check out their podcast, Fieldwork. And especially if you're a consumer and you want to hear about all the science and all the production that goes into row crops, be sure to check it out as well. So their podcast is Fieldwork, and the hosts are Zach and Mitchell. And today our guest is Mitchell. And just a quick heads up, there is a little issue with a little bitty part of the audio. Whenever I was asking him a question about what Iowa agriculture is like, it didn't capture my question. So just a quick little heads up, you can kind of tell that that's what the question was, because he's like, oh yeah, Iowa agriculture is this and that. Just a quick heads up. This episode 43 of the Farm Traveler podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy it. Mitchell Hora, welcome to the Farm Traveler Podcast. How are you doing, man? Fantastic. Uh, up here in snowy Iowa. Super jealous of the snow. Down here in Florida, it's always super hot, so I'm jealous <laughs> of the snow. <laughs> so uh, It's kind of icy and nasty kind of snow, though. It's not a very pretty snow. Oh, not yeah, not the fun snow. Okay, I can imagine. No, no, not the fun snow. <laughs> so you're a fellow ag guy and a fellow podcaster, so we, you've got a podcast called Fieldwork, but w- before we kind of dive into that, Tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of your background, where you grew up, and what you're doing right now. Yeah, I'm a seventh generation farmer from southeast Iowa. Um, grew up on a relatively small family operation, about 800 acres of row crop. Um, so we're in southeast Iowa. Family's been farming there for just shy of 150 years. So pretty cool legacy. Uh, you know, a lot of my family involved in ag. My dad still does, you know, most of the day to day farming. I did buy, buy a farm here just a couple of years ago, um, so actually involved in, in helping him out a lot, especially during busy times, trying to keep building up the, the family farm. Um, but I own a soil health company, essentially, soil health data company, um, Continual Mag is my company that I spend most of my time on. Uh, we help other farmers to quantify and improve their soil health. So we've got some software and do some consulting and stuff along those lines. And yeah, I also host a podcast called Fieldwork. And Fieldwork is about sustainable ag uh, brought to you by two just conventional farmers. And uh, so myself and my background down on our farm in Iowa, my co-host is Zach Johnson, the Minnesota millennial farmer is what he goes by on his uh his online name. He's got a big YouTube channel and stuff for people to definitely check that out also. Um, and yeah, our field, our uh, podcast is, it's fun for me being a farm guy. And Zach is a farm guy going on this podcast uh, produced by Minnesota public radio and American public media. So it's like super legit. And the ending product always sounds really good even though, uh, yeah, it's just a couple of farm kids talking about farming and interviewing other people. There you go. Yeah, that sounds really legit. Awesome. How, how did you guys kind of stumble upon, like, making the podcast? Like, what was that whole creation process like? Stumble upon it is the exact terminology of how it all came together. Um, I, uh, I was speaking at an event in Iowa that Minnesota Public Radio, Iowa Public Radio were involved with. They were doing a, it was a water quality on tap event deal where they were having a series of events from the start of the Mississippi River all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, having events at breweries along the way. And they'd bring on panels and have discussion about water quality and farming and all that. And uh, I got 
kind of roped into being on this panel um, because I'm on the local Farm Bureau board and my uncle is a regional manager, knew that um, there was this event, knew that I'd done a lot of speaking and done things like this. So he asked me to do it. And yeah, it was an event at a brewery talking about, you know, soil health and uh, yeah, beer and dirt are pretty high on my list of priorities. So it was a good fit. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Then the, the uh, Minnesota public radio people found me there and like, Hey, we're trying to do a podcast. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, keep me in the loop or whatever. And they hit me up and then they, they, we're reaching out to Zach as well because of his mega um, social media following and they merged the two of us together. We met the night before we got into the, into the studio. We just rolled with it. So. Yeah. It seems like it's been really cool. That's really <laughs> neat. Uh, what are some example guests that you guys have had on and some topics that y'all have discussed? Yeah. So like, um, you know, higher up people with different companies like farmers, business, like you know, founder of Farmer Business Network, um, working on like, you know, the CEO of, In, of Indigo, um, number two guy at NRCS out of DC, um, multiple people from universities like Minnesota and Iowa State, of course, is kind of just where we naturally focus, but we've had people from like Colorado State, um, a variety of different university kind of people. Uh, so it's a mixture of like university kind of people, PhDs, you know, researchers. Uh, we always tie in farmers, even though Zach and I really bring a lot of the farmer perspective, but we always like to bring in other real farmers that are actually doing this stuff. And then we bring in other businesses as well, like other consulting kind of groups. Uh, we've talked about renewable energy. We do a lot of stuff about cover crops. We talk about tillage. We talk about drain tile. We talk about ecosystem markets for like carbon credits and things like that, um, a variety of different topics with the whole purpose of sustainability is different for every farm. It's not a one size fits all. There's a lot of different things that you can do on your operation to be more sustainable, uh, which really just means continuing to do better day over day, focus on, you know, not only sustainable profits, and making sure you're economically sustainable, but also mentally resilient and environmentally sustainable. So, you know, it's kind of the combination of that, but it's been awesome to have on a, a variety of really big time kind of guests um, and just farmers. So it's, it's a really interesting kind of dynamic there. It sounds like it. So going off the sustainability thing, as somebody – as somebody like outside of agriculture would look, I, I bet that they would assume that sustainability would kind of look the same. Like, oh, you want to save water. The dirt's kind of they're going to be mostly the same. So and, and you have really good experience with this. What are some ways that sustainability differs per farms? Like, what's that look like? It's, it really boils down to the individual specifics of it. And so for me, you know, my angle into this as an, you know, my background is I'm an agronomist. I'm a farmer. I'm a consultant. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm a soil health advocate. And when I'm advocating for soil health, you know, I'm talking about the principles of soil health, which are minimize disturbance, keep the ground covered, you know, provide armor, uh, keep living root at all time, instill diversity, and integrate livestock. So for me, being more sustainable means factoring in those five principles of soil health, continuing to move the needle all the time, exactly how those principles are going to work on your farm versus my farm and even my neighbor's farm is all very different. And uh, so we can utilize the same general principles and that's why the principles are universal. They can work everywhere, but how you tweak it is very different. You know, the cover crops that we use in Iowa are very different than what are able to be used up in Minnesota, very different than what guys use in Tennessee or in Georgia. Um, it's just different tools in the toolbox, although the overall goals are the same. You said you're a soil guy. So going off of your background with soil, what kind of, I mean, so cover crops, basically when your main crop is done growing, 
you plant something else that can kind of regenerate the soil and put a lot of nutrients back in those soils. So what are some super duper benefits of doing cover crops as opposed to just throwing out a bunch of fertilizers? So what are some really good advantages yeah. of cover crops there? Yeah, well, so my whole approach into this is, you know, we're farming in Iowa and this all used to be prairie before, you know, before we got here. And that prairie meant that there was a lot of diverse species on that prairie. There was animals that were roaming that prairie and uh, that that prairie was living all the time. Always had living roots in the ground, always had protection over the soil. The soil was never bare. And uh, even over the winter, like right now, you know, that those species go kind of dormant. You know, they, they essentially hibernate, you know, for the winter. They go dormant, they slow down, um, and then they come back over the winter. Where in our typical row crop situation, I'm planting my corn and soybeans in April, typically mid-April through mid to late um, May. And uh, then I'm harvesting that crop starting mid to late September, going through early November, kind of depending on how weather helps us or hurts us uh, like it's done here recently. So really, you know, I'm growing something from April through October, we'll say, but um, I'm leaving a majority of the year where I don't have any kind of a crop that's living on my fields. Although nature intended this ground to have a living roots on it at all times like in the prairie. So now what we're doing is I'm planting a cover crop, which a cover crop by definition is, is a crop that's only used to keep that ground covered, you know, for conservation purposes. I'm not making any money directly off that crop. So I'm not harvesting it for grain. You, it, it gets, you know, some gray area in terms of harvesting it for forage or for grazing livestock on it or making hay off of it. Um, there's a little gray area there on what's a cover crop versus what's not. Um, the overall purpose is, you know, just to keep something alive all the time, keep living roots. Um, and those living roots, you know, are paying off a lot of benefit to us. We're seeing gains in terms of biological activity because we're feeding those microbes. We're feeding those microbes carbon that we're sequestering out of the atmosphere as CO2. And it's so the plant is breathing in CO2 through photosynthesis. And it's taking the carbon and exuding it through the roots to feed those microbes. And microbes, of course, are eating very simple compounds, and, uh, but they need sugar for energy. Well, carbon through those exudates comes out basically as sugar. It's food for the microbes. And in exchange for the food, the microbes are essentially pooping back out nutrients and stuff and bringing nutrients to the plant in an available form, essentially fertilizing that plant for us better than what we can fertilize it with synthetic um, inputs. Now we're still using synthetic inputs. We're not an organic farm. Um, I think in Iowa, I don't even know if it's half of 1% of farm ground is organic. Um, you know, it's, it's conventional systems, but we're just integrating more of these regenerative practices that instill continual improvement of the parameters of soil health, the principles. Yeah, so I was number one for corn, number one for hogs. Um, number one, we switched back and forth between number one and number two for soybeans, um, but we're actually also number one for eggs. We're number one for ethanol. And we're number one for wind energy, which is very interesting. So renewable energy, you know, feeding people with, you know, eggs, poultry, pork. There's a lot of cattle, of course, but there's some other states that, that beat us in that category. Um, and then fueling people as well, you know, through renewable energy, renewable fuels. Um, a, lot of, a lot of biodiesel, a lot of ethanol, a lot of wind energy, a lot of solar energy as well. Like that, um, you know, we're able to utilize the vast landscape to really be able to provide a lot of different kind of benefits. Now, you know, now we're working on how do we implement a little bit more diversity, especially into our cropping systems, that, yeah, we're corn and beans and a lot of corn and beans, but not a lot of some of these other crops, 
even though, you know, in Iowa, we're extremely blessed and thankful to have some of the best farm ground in the world, we can grow a lot of different things. Um, but the problem is having a market for those crops, having a market for those other products, that's where we can run into some issues. You know, we are extremely good, probably the best in the world as American agriculturalists to produce corn and soybeans and other commodities as efficiently as possible um, in a manner that is safe good for the supply chain, provides affordable food for the world. Um, and in order to do that, we've implemented these economies of scale to help to uh, really get the efficiencies in order. Now there's a lot of backlash that, hey, we need to get out of these monoculture systems, which means you know, growing only one species on the field. And as I mentioned with the prairie, there was a lot of different species that were always growing at the same time. And those different species interact with each other through biological processes and they feed off of each other. You know, they work synergistically with each other. Where in our current um, agricultural systems, we try to eliminate some of that competition. We try to control as many of the variables as we can. Um, in order to raise as many bushels of corn and soybeans as I possibly can on my farm, because that is what I'm being economically rewarded for. You know, that's what's driving my business is how many bushels of corn and soybeans can I produce? You know, how much volume can I produce? Um, where really we need to be focused on producing good quality products that are profitable. We have to be profitable. It's a business you know, if we're not profitable, um, none of this sustainability talk matters. If the family farm goes out of business, none of this matters because you don't have the farm there anymore to even help in this fight. Um, so it's got to be economically profitable, but it needs to be environmentally sustainable. You know, there's a lot of good positives to it. You know, I, I kind of see both ends. I don't know. You know, I'm not an expert on it by any means, just from what I've heard, you know, and what I've seen because they, they we had a uh, company approached uh, the county that I'm in a couple of years ago, and they were really trying to push and put up a, a big wind farm right in our area. And the backlash was, you know, you have to set up all new roads and everything through your fields, through some of this, you know, super productive soil. You're not only putting up a, a slab, a massive area of concrete and rock area around this windmill um, to anchor this thing, but also you have to have a road that goes to it. And you have to have a road that links all of those together that goes off of the current road systems that are already in that are all square and nice and neat. Now you're putting in all these other pathways through your fields. You have to widen other roads, like gravel roads have to be widened in order to get these massive wings um, around corners and get them into place. You've got all this equipment stuff, tearing up roads, you know, that as taxpayers, you know, that all is coming out of our pocket at the end of the day. Um, the noise of it, I'm not, not too worried about that. Yeah, there's some there's some issues with noise and with with uh, the view and with, you know, they I've heard about them, you know, killing birds and, and ice chunks and stuff fly off of them and like that can cause some damage. You know, so there's some things there, but now I'm, I'm seeing more backlash too on like, yeah, obviously the, the energy that it produces um, as an individual, like as it's producing, yeah, it can have a super low carbon footprint, but the materials and the equipment and like everything to get those windmills set up has a super high carbon footprint too. So I don't know exactly, you know, I've, like I said, I'm not an expert, um, but I don't know about what is the bottom line car carbon footprint and the overall energy needed to produce and maintain and construct these things versus what they give us in return. I don't know. Um, I don't know how that all shapes up. The other, the other issues is um, you do give up, you know, all of your wind rights. So it does become a headache when you want to build, you know, um, a building or a barn or a, a new grain bin on your field. Uh, there's a lot of red tape there. You got somebody else that's dictating what you can and can't do. Um, on your farm. So, so that kind of stinks. And then also something that really wasn't addressed when they were starting to build these wind farms is 
what happens when that windmill is out of commission? You know, when it's gone through its life cycle, whose responsibility is it to refurbish this thing or to tear it down to, are we going to recycle it? What are we going to do with these things? They don't last for forever. And that was never really figured out. I don't think they thought that far ahead. It's like, I think most of the windmills have like a 20 year life cycle. So now there's a lot of windmills that are coming out of commission and uh, you've got this massive foundation of concrete out in the middle of your field. You got rock out in the middle of your field to deal with. And this windmill that is it your responsibility to tear this thing down or is it the company's or what? And it could end up costing you all of the money that you received in a payment um, for them to put up that windmill in the first place. So I don't know. Um, it, I definitely don't discourage it, but it's, really look into the fine print you know as a farmer if you're going to get into the wind energy space i think that's on average you know but somebody's got to figure out like okay well now what do we do <laughs> like that obviously don't last for forever and makes you think about other structures you know other things that we build too it's like well shoot like whose responsibility is it after like yeah these things don't last for forever Lots of people adapting that. Um, and where I really see it is putting it on like your hog building, putting it on your cattle shed, putting it on, you know, your poultry built poultry barn um, that you can put it on the roof, kind of out of the way, provides a really good source of, of energy, pretty cost effective. Um, you know, there's definitely still some maintenance kind of things there. Those don't last for forever. Um, the sun doesn't shine all the time. <laughs> you know, that's another problem. Uh, the wind blows majority of the time. You could probably get some wind and wind energy. Um, I don't know what the minimum, you know, uh, wind speed needs to be to get those big old propellers moving. But um, so there, there's pros and cons to all of it. But I know I have a lot of farmers that I work with that have solar panels. Um, it, it's another good tool and it helps, you know, it, it is helping to reduce your, your impact on the grid. And, you know, in livestock production, especially, there can be a lot of, of input going into it. So utilizing, you know, renewable energy directly on the farm to offset that, I think is a good thing. Yeah, you know, so I think during the summer, like a lot of times they're getting a little bit of a credit. And then over the winter, when we don't have as much sunlight um, and a lot more cloud cover and shorter days as well, and those barns are using a lot more energy to heat those, those buildings and stuff. Um, then, you know, I think at the end of the year, it's kind of net neutral, you know, that their expenses are more in the winter, less in the summer, you know, and so at the end of the day, it all, it all works out, but it is a great source, you know, to, to balance that out and improve the bottom line as a farmer. Yeah. You know, uh, global domination is pretty high on the list, you know, so, <laughs> um, no, we, yeah, 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 no, my, my overall goal with the podcast you now is, is being able to have an ag podcast that's super informative that we're really getting into like some pretty nitty gritty kind of stuff. And, and with uh, the guests that we have on, but just trying to keep it fun as well, trying to keep it entertaining, you know, and just, and as your listeners know, you know, they want something that's entertaining. That was something that is educational that they're going to get some value out of, but that it's interesting to listen to. It's engaging to listen to. So that's really a focus for me. Um, but just continuing to get on really good guests to showcase farmers that are uh, really working hard on their own farms and trying to do their part to be more sustainable. Um, and just to provide a community, I think, for farmers who want more resources, who want to be part of the conversation, who maybe aren't, aren't quite sure where to start. You know, they're not quite sure what's going to be the right tools to use on their farm. They're not quite sure how do they go about it. Where do they get more, more help, more resources? Who can they talk to? You know, if we can help to talk to the experts, you know, we can talk to the right folks and uh, connect our listeners to those people to continue on the conversation well beyond the reach of the podcast. That's what we want. You know, that in ag, in sustainability, we need to all be preaching the same message. We need to all be on the same team. With sustainability, my view is we're either all going to win or we're all going to lose, which means that there's a lot of opportunity to get everybody involved, 
everyone's got to play a part. Um, we just hope to be part of the conversation to help to lead the charge. And, um, but to be real about it too, that this is not all going to be rainbows and butterflies. This is going to be work. You're going to have to buy in. It's going to cost money. Hopefully we can get some support, you know, from companies and from the consumer to help us to continue to do better, get everybody working in the same, same direction. And uh, if we can amplify that message, I think a podcast is a great platform to do that. The big thing for me is just showing that there's opportunity. Um, a big focus of mine is, you know, agriculture, um, I think it's the ag and forestry industry, um, has one of the highest suicide rates of any industry, which is a terrible um, stat to be at the top of the list on. And the problem is it's, it's a lot of risk. Uh, there's a lot of negative publicity that we've got in agriculture. There's a lot of uncertainty in terms of uh, markets, trade, um, profitability, weather, and uh, connecting with that consumer and, and understanding how to be competitive in the ag space. It is really tough. Um, so providing some hope for farmers, providing you know, a, uh, a virtual friend essentially too, you know, and providing community um, is really a focus for me. Um, just showing that, hey, there, there's, there's some fun things that we can be doing on our farm, that implementing and learning and working with nature is a lot more fun than working against her. And uh, so here's some ideas about how to do that better. You know, here's other people that are doing it. You can do it too just tweak the conversation to be specific for your farm. Um, and if we can help you to have that conversation to get going, get the ball rolling and uh, we can amplify that message. That's, that's awesome. And provide opportunity for, for farmers, for rural communities, for, you know, for rural America and for other farmers around the world too. Like um, there's a lot of opportunity ahead of us. So keep your head up and see that, you know, we're playing a very crucial role here um, to feed the world, to take care of people. And here's ways to do it in a manner that mimics nature, in a manner that can be sustainable and profitable for your farm. And you touch base on something that a lot of people outside of ag don't know, and that's that there are super high suicide rates right now. I mean, in the dairy industry, in whatever industry in ag, I mean, the suicide rates are skyrocketing because it's so difficult right now, and people's messages are getting so skewed because of, you know, the whole fake news propaganda. Yeah. Going so it's, it's a very interesting space right now. Um, yeah. 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 No, and you keep seeing, like, different suicide stuff pops up on my radar online. And also like grain bin injuries and stuff, grain bin deaths continues to come up. It's like, man, guys, we have, we got to be careful. We got to look out for each other. Um, we got to be smart. Uh, farming can be an extremely rewarding lifestyle, um, but it is dangerous. Um, and it is, it's hard on people. And, and farmers, I think, you know, are, are looked at as tough guys, you know, tough guys and gals that are out there working the land that it's, you know, a lot, a lot of times, no days off. It is hard work, and uh, it can be very stressful. And so factoring in as many of the, you know, just controlling as many of the variables as we can, I think is really critical. And that's what we try to do in terms of managing soil health and working better with nature to manage that variable better, because there is so much that's out of our control so trying to control and work with nature, not against her, um, is a way to, to make sure that opportunities are there and um, that there's reward at the end of the day. So, all right. So I'm really excited to get your thoughts on this because I try to ask this to all of our guests. And that is their thoughts on the farmer-consumer relationship right now. There's a lot of misinformation out there, but a lot of farmers are kind of going to social media to kind of spread their message. So what are your thoughts right now on the farmer-consumer relationship? That is a really, really good question. Um, it's interesting. From what I'm seeing right now, and um, I'll, I'll go into an example here first. I was just at a conference yesterday, and uh, it was an ag conference uh, for farm investors. And there was a guy, uh, right in the guy from California, that was talking about fake meat. But he was, he's a, 
an entrepreneur, a founder of one of these companies. And he's worked as an executive in these, you know, manufactured meat and meat alternative companies. And he was given his spiel on how great this stuff is and that it's just like real meat, but it has like, here's this environmental impact. It was showing these stats and these numbers that I know when he's given this talk um, in a non-ag setting, when he's given this talk where he normally does out in California, I bet he's getting standing ovations, getting people hooting and hollering and getting people all revved up looking at these stats that he was showing up that all of us in the room are like, uh, these are not true at all. And you don't have any sources for this information that you're spewing. And you are not understanding what is happening out here at all in terms of how we are actually doing things and how agriculture actually works, especially in terms of animal agriculture, where we are taking care of our animals because that's our livelihood. We're feeding those animals more nutritious food all the time that's raised more sustainably that is sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere we're recycling the nutrients that are coming out of those animals to reduce our synthetic fertilizers synthetic fertilizers have a super high carbon footprint as well you know and in producing food extremely healthy nutritious food out of plants out of crops that we cannot digest directly but we can produce super high nutritious proteins out of those foods um, that throughout the holistic system can have a extremely net negative carbon in, carbon footprint. You know, that we can sequester that carbon. We can improve the water use efficiencies. We can farm extremely sustainably and feed people in a manner that is natural. And that, you know, that the push for alternative meats, fake meats, whatever, like that is the most unnatural thing that you could possibly have. Like these people don't want us to utilize genetically enhanced crops because it's not natural, but we're going to utilize a literally genetically manufactured fake product. Like that is the most unnatural thing ever. And, and not all of them are completely not natural and, and completely you know, manufactured in a lab. I know there's a lot of different types of meat alternatives, but we need to call it what it is. That here is the facts behind it. It is a choice. I'm not saying that we're not gonna, you know, that we need to completely get rid of all this, but being real with the consumer. And like you brought up, the fake news behind all this stuff is super real. And that as the takeaway though from this talk yesterday was, okay, this guy giving this spiel on that he literally thinks that these meat alternatives are going to save the world and that we need to not have animal agriculture period anymore. Like we have to tell our message. We have to get aggressive to tell our story, to educate people on what, on the facts and utilize statistics that actually have credible sources behind them, not just throw up numbers just on a whim. Like that is not good. And, and uh, in the age of connectivity and transparency, that is what, you know, is going to really drive these consumer decisions. And that I think is going to help us to foster this relationship with the consumer. And back to the question, you know, that the consumer I think does want to be connected with where their food comes from. They're used to data. They want to understand or want to at least have the, the tools there to dig into this more and to understand that they have the sources there to be more educated, but we have to be able to provide that information in a credible manner to show them what we actually do on our farms, that we all want sustainability. We all want to farm better. We all want to farm in a manner that is positive on the environment, that feeds people nutritious food um, in a manner that is economical and that uh, is affordable by everybody. Um, but if we're going to do this, we all need to work together here and identify what are the goals going to be. You know, sustainability, regenerative ag, a lot of buzzwords right now around that. And um, I have a, I, I, my view on that is we need to improve upon four categories, which is we need to continuously improve 
upon our carbon impact, our water quality impact, our water use efficiency, and nutrient density of the crops and the food that we are producing, the actual quality at the end of the day, and not rely upon labels that have a perception of quality behind them, but rely upon actual scientific data to prove the quality and to prove the environmental um, impact and just to be more transparent with exactly what we're doing on our, on our farms and connect with the consumer and allow them to drive how they want foods to be produced, but realizing that some of these ways of doing things more sustainably, of trying to instill new practices come with a lot of economic risk and logistic risk. Um, so if the consumer wants us to farm differently than what we are now, we can do that and we are continuing, continuing to improve as much as we can. But if we're gonna make drastic change, uh, we've gotta have a economic driver to help to make that happen at scale. Uh, just because the, the way the ag economy is right now, it is way too big of a risk to try to make a massive change. Gotcha. Yeah, you brought up a lot of really good points. I totally agree. Um, and it made me think of the old Ben Shapiro saying, "Facts don't care, or facts don't care about your opinions or your feelings. You know, yeah, yeah. Facts don't care about your yeah, opinions." Yeah. And yeah, I saw it was one of those fake meat companies on Instagram. They had this poster up that like, "Oh, we want to completely remove animal agriculture from the world." I'm like, "That's probably right. never going to happen." And they're saying, "Not going to happen." Yeah, and they're saying that the like the Impossible Burger is so much healthier. Well. It's got, I think, 300% more sodium than a regular burger, but they're not yeah. saying that at all. But they're saying, oh, it's better than a beef burger. Well, really, is it? Oh. So, yeah. No. It's, it's, it's so interesting. Nasty. Yeah, exactly. I, I, have you like, tried it yet? Want, no, no, I'm not going. Like, I don't know. I, I, I assume I'll run into one somewhere and we'll, like, take a bite. But I can, I'm, cannot put money towards these people that are going to spread this kind of crap like yeah totally really agree. like the whole point here and like consumers like come on like you want natural you want like you want real you want to be connected with nature and connected with food but we're going to do it in a way that is the most unnatural thing ever like that is so backwards to me where there was always animals on this land there people have been working and caring for animals for forever like that's what we did that's what our ancestors have always done and our that's what our bodies are designed to do that we're omnivores like we eat both <laughs> we eat plants and animals like that's what we're designed for and uh, that's how nature works that's how god intended this to work is uh that it's a complete system and if you completely throw off that balance by removing part of the part of the food web part of the animal uh kingdom like what do you think that's going to do for the environment? Like that's going to be, that's going to completely throw everything out of whack. If we remove all that, like we need to do better. We, we have to do better. We have to continue to improve not only in the sustainability of it, uh, in the environmental footprint, in the water footprint, in the animal livelihood and livelihood of people as well. Um, we've got to continue to do better on that, but people are, like farmers are continuing to do better. They have invested tons into their operations to continue to do better. Um, and just continue to drive like, okay, what do we really want here? What is the goal at the end of the day? Like the goal is to be natural, be sustainable, care for the environment. We can do that with animal agriculture. Like there's a huge piece of being able to feed the world and being able to feed the world sustainably um, where they can also integrate livestock into their operations and feed their families in a manner that is affordable and environmentally sustainable. Absolutely, all totally agree. Such good points. Um, well, man, Mitchell, this has been a really cool conversation. Talk about all things ag related. Talk about your podcast. So if people want to listen to your podcast, which is called Fieldwork, where can they find you guys? And where can they listen? Yeah, to you? we're we're everywhere. Fieldworktalk.org on all the different uh, podcast hosting systems, all over social media, of course, too. Um, all my stuff on social media. Um, you can find me at 
you know, through um, just search of Mitchell Hora. But a lot of my stuff is through my company. Um, so at continuumagllc.com. Uh, so find me on there. I've got a bunch of info. Like my, my big aim in all this is to be the catalyst for getting the data into this and utilizing things like blockchain, utilizing artificial intelligence, utilizing big data to help to drive value and to drive better decision making using technology. And uh, that's what I think there's a lot of opportunity here to utilize technology, uh, to be more transparent, to make better decisions on the farm and uh, to show the consumer, hey, here's what is real. Here's actual information about what we do on our farms um, and utilize the quantitative and qualitative data to tell our story. That, you know, as agriculturalists, we all need to definitely advocate more. We have to understand we are, everything is public. <laughs> no, there's no privacy anymore. Everything you do, people are gonna know about it. So do things right, take better care, continue to improve your operation. And I think focus on the vision too of what you want your operation to be, what you want your farm to be, where you want it to be for generations to come. And um, thinking more long-term versus only focusing on how am I gonna pay back the banker? How am I gonna pay my bills today? You know, we have to focus on those, but, but look more holistically, I think as well, and start working on, you know, how do I wanna leave this farm and, and focus on the legacy pieces of farming. Um, it's a business, it has to be a business, um, but it, you know, there is a bigger purpose here as farmers and, uh, we, we want to work with the consumer. And I think the overall thing too, for me too, is, you know, we realize that some of the things that we've, that we've done in agriculture, some of the things we've implemented have led to some negatives in terms of water quality, dead zone, uh, CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Like we realize that we're not naive to, uh, to the facts because there is, data behind all that and uh we're ready to be part of the solution and not only be part of the finger pointing and blaming others but part of being part being in the solution but uh it has to be a complete change in uh, the economic drivers in order to implement this stuff um, and how we're going to connect to the consumer and uh, how we're going to utilize data to shape the future of agriculture. Uh, but we're ready to do it. We're ready to be part of this. Farmers are excited. I was at a conference last week about um, this is the National No-Till Conference. There's a thousand farmers there. Like there's people that want to do these things that are excited about working with the consumer, being transparent, improving upon their operations. But uh, we've got to have everybody working together here to really get this done. Yeah, that's awesome. It's all about everybody kind of pulling their own weight and doing what we can to help the environment and also providing a lot of good ag commodities to consumers. So really good points. It's exciting. And, and thanks for your efforts as well. We'll keep fighting the good fight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I keep telling people it's a good fight. We got to keep it up. We got to help informing people. So it is definitely a good fight. Well, Mitchell, this has been cool, man. We'll stay up to date with your podcast and all the things you're doing. Thanks so much for coming on. A lot of really good content and we'll talk to you soon. You bet. Thanks for having me. Well, cool. absolutely. Thanks, man. Mm -hmm.